Hello, welcome to Chapter 6A, where we're going to be focused on understanding the financial performance and health of entities. And what are we going to use to help us do that? You guessed it. We're going to use our gap basis financial statement. So we are going to keep building on what you learned in financial accounting here. So without any further ado, let's get started. All right, so first up, what do we mean by financial statement analysis? Well, financial statement analysis is just going to be this tool that helps us answer things like, how is this company or division or project performing? And from an equity investor's point of view, we might want to ask, should I purchase this company's stock? From a debt investor's point of view, we might want to ask, it's, uh, should we make a loan to this company? It's going to help us with questions like that. And within a company, it's going to help us answer things like, should we fire this division manager? Is he doing a bad job? Or something like, should we drop this line of business? Is it just inherently unprofitable? It's also something that typically aims to look at an entity's performance in two dimensions. On the one hand, we always want to be looking at the company compared to its history. Are we improving our operations? Are we reducing our costs? Are we increasing our revenue? And on the other hand, we're also looking to see how we're doing compared to others in the industry. So we want to look at ourselves versus comparables, or what we call for short comps. So this whole chapter, a lot of this chapter is going to be worked around an example of two airline companies, United Airlines and Southwest. And I want to take us back in time to a very interesting period, the Great Recession. And we'll really be looking right at the worst of the Great Recession in Q4 2008. Remember, things got a little worse in the first quarter of 2009, but Q4 2008 was, was pretty horrific. So what were the macroeconomics at the time? So of course, as we know, we were in the greatest recession since the Great Depression and the implications for the airline industry were that a lot of travel was curtailed and required travel was being done as cheaply as possible. So in other words, you couldn't just hop on a plane and say, you know, well, woohoo, I'm going to go visit this branch office for two weeks just for fun. You know, you might have a video call. Video calling was nascent and expensive, but uh, definitely working at that time. Um, and for times when it, you really did have to travel on uh, business. It was done as cheaply as possible. So probably weren't going to be in flying first class or business class. Okay, the second macroeconomic thing that was going on that had a big impact on the airline industry was the Gulf War at the time uh, in Iraq. And this was causing the cost of oil to skyrocket and therefore the cost of jet fuel to skyrocket. So here's a graph of oil price uh, going up to the fourth quarter of 2008. Um, which is right around here. And you can see that we didn't know it at the time, but oil price had uh, prices had peaked in July of 2008, and they were still very, very high through this, this whole range. So of course, that put a lot of pressure on the airlines because it increased their, their cost. Fuel is about uh, one third to 40% of their cost typically. Um, so like I said, we want to uh, look at United Airlines and Southwest. We're gonna compare and contrast these two. So let's get started by looking at what United was at the time. United was what was called and still would be called today a legacy airline. Legacy meaning um, it was around back in the days when airlines were heavily regulated by the government and they've since become unregulated. So they had two key features here. They had these typical hub and spoke logistics. So they would have a hub. Um, United had a hub in Newark. It had a hub in Texas, in Houston, and it had another hub in Ohio. So if you wanted to fly, for example, um, from somewhere in New Mexico to somewhere in Vermont, you would fly probably to the Ohio hub, then the Newark hub, and then off to Vermont. So you'd have two changes along the way. And United also also was a full service market niche operator. So their marketing strategy was to be a full service airline. You could be first class, 
business class, economy class. They wanted the whole spectrum of customers. Some other things that, that were important about these legacy airlines and United in particular was that they generally all had a very high cost structure with lots of debt. Why? Well, the all of them had this full service market niche and that makes it such that you're uh you've got to have three different types of food you've got to train for three different types of services for your stewards and stewardesses um etc cetera, etc cetera. and this was actually compounded by united which had many different types of airplanes they had airplanes from airbus Boeing and McConnell Douglas. And within those three groups, they had um, many different brands of airplanes, many different types, the 747, the 737. So all of their pilots and all of their crews had to be trained on those different types of airlines. Okay, so what else was happening? In general, the bad economy was definitely reducing sales. The Gulf War, as we talked about, was increasing fuel costs. And also these legacy airlines were getting hammered by some new low cost competitors. Southwest was one of them, JetBlue was one of them, and they were taking market share big time. So let's talk about Southwest and why it was able to take market share and how it was doing. So Southwest is one of these new low cost competitors like JetBlue, Alaska Air, etc. And typically these guys had two things in their strategy. Their marketing strategy was to say, we're going to be budget. We're going to go for economy class only. And Southwest was really bottom of the barrel economy class. You couldn't even reserve a seat on a Southwest airline at this time. It was kind of like getting on a Greyhound bus, you know, so everyone would try to jockey to get a good seat while boarding was going on. And they also characteristically did not have a hub and spoke system. They had what's called a point to point logistics system that looks something like this. And the way that it works is if, for example, uh, in Austin, Texas, 10 gates would open up, uh, Southwest would go in and grab those. And same thing if some gates opened up in Miami, they'd go in and grab those. So they just opportunistically build their structure by gates that they could get. And then for each place where they were located, like Austin, Texas, in this case, they would say, okay, where do we want to fly to out of there? Maybe not directly to Miami, um, but maybe somewhere in Georgia, maybe Atlanta, and then uh, to Miami from there. Maybe we do want to fly directly to Phoenix and Arizona, that, that, type of, that type of thing. So this also, this uh, logistics graph looks very much like, for those of you who have seen it, uh, the spider who makes a web while they're on LSD. And if you haven't seen that, I suggest you Google it and look it up. It looks a lot like this. Okay, so another um, thing about this particular to Southwest is that Southwest was only flying Boeing 30, uh, 737 planes, so that meant that all of their maintenance costs were similar. Their mechanics only had to be trained on one type of plane. Their pilots only had to be trained on one type of plane. Their stewards and stewardesses had to be only trained on one type of plane. So that gave them a very low cost structure as well. All right, so now we need to think about, this is more broad than just the airline industry. When we're analyzing the financial performance and health of entities, we always need to think about, are they seasonal or are they not seasonal? And what do I mean by that? A seasonal company is a company that has a lot of sales in the fourth quarter, for example, and not so many sales, say, in the second quarter. So a lot of retail companies are good examples of that. They have a lot of their sales. Their peak sales are in the fourth quarter around Hanukkah and Christmas and associated holidays, and they get some big sales in August building up to back to school as well, that type of, that type of thing. And in January, February, February, they typically have a trough in their sales. So the same thing is going to turn out to be true for these airline companies, although it's not, not completely intuitive why that would be true. So we want to understand um, if a company is seasonal or not, because if it is seasonal, then we have to compare accounting periods year on year, okay, instead of quarter on quarter. So this is going to be for seasonal. 
companies, okay, and sequentially is going to be for non-seasonal. Non Okay, so an example of a non-seasonal company would be Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble sells uh, dish detergent, it sells laundry detergent, it sells paper towels, it sells toilet paper, it sells baby diapers, stuff like that. These are all things that are uh, consumer commodities and, and they're needed all year round, pretty, pretty much uni uniformly. Uh, retail banks, commercial banks, things like that also turn out to be uh, non-seasonal. Okay, so in general, when you've got a company to analyze, you need to know is it seasonal or not. It's not intuitively obvious always, and I would argue for both you UAL and Southwest, ticker symbol LUV, it's not intuitively obvious. So how are we going to suss this out? Well, one way we could do this is to look at the pattern of sales on the historical income statements. So I've got six quarters of income statements, most recently reported one, June 30, 2008. Remember, we're in Q4 of 2008 right now. And we could just sort of look at these and maybe plot these and see if we're getting something like if we're getting something like a sine wave pattern here, where this would be, say, for example, Q1, and this would be a year later, Q5, one year later. Okay, then we'd sort of be able to argue that this was uh, a seasonal company. On the other hand, if we got something like this, This would be looking much more like a non-seasonal company, Procter & Gamble, something something like that. For, so for these seasonal companies, what I mean when I say we have to compare year, year on year is we have to compare this Q5 to the year prior quarter, not to Q4, not to its nearby neighbor. But for Procter & Gamble, we can definitely compare its Q5 here to its Q4 and its Q4 to its Q3, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be sequential. All right. So with all that said, I'm looking at this. You can plot this, but you know it's hard to suss out a pattern here with only six quarters, and we're in the middle of the Great Recession, which is throwing everything off. So that's going to make it difficult here. Okay, problems with this because we have the Great Recession. We only have six quarters of data. So what's a poor equity analyst to do? Well, there's one thing that is awesome that you can do, and that's to go to sec.gov and find the company's latest financial filing, which is called a 10K. That's their latest annual filing. And for UAL, I've got a quote from their 10K filing that says this, due to greater man demand for air travel during the summer months, our revenue in the second and third quarters of the year is generally stronger than our revenue in the first and fourth quarters. Our results of op operations reflect this seasonality. Companies have to say in their 10Ks that they're seasonal if they believe they are seasonal. So you can just look that up, get that file, do a search for seasonality or season and see what happens. Okay, so based on its own reporting to the SEC, which better be right or it's fraud jail for them, it ain't gonna be much fun for them, we're going to assume that they are a seasonal company and love should be the same. So we're going to want to make most comparisons on a year-on-year -year basis. All right, so we're going to be looking at to understand the uh, performance and financial health of entities. We're going to be looking at financial statements and what are we going to do to help us understand what's going on with the financial statements? We're going to use ratio analysis, which you may have seen a little bit before in managerial accounting. We have a kind of different tack on it in this class. Um, so ratio analysis is just defined to be the building up of useful ratios from a company's financial statements. That's, that's it, okay? And when we do ratio analysis, we're we're always going to be wanting to look at a company's ratios versus its comparables, right? Its competitors who are only in the same lines of business and to the company's history. Are we improving? Are sales getting better? Are profits getting better? That sort of, that sort of thing. Okay, so let's, let me give you a quick example of uh, the type of ratio we use in ratio analysis all the time and why it's so awesomely, awesomely helpful. So here's an example. We've got what we call the asset efficiency ratio here, and it's defined to be sales in a period and divided by assets at the beginning of the period. All 
all right, so what's the what's the big deal with this? Let's just think about it for a second. What is this really telling us? We have total assets at the beginning of the period in the denominator and sales in the numerator. So this is really telling us in words the amount of sales that a company could generate in a period given the assets it had to work with in the beginning of the period. That is just so cool and exciting to me. And if it is to you too, Possibly you just need to get a life, but possibly you might want to think about a career in finance if you haven't already. Okay, so this is a wonderful thing. And what do we want to do with this? As usual, we want to compare this asset efficiency ratio to the company's own history. Is it getting better? Is it getting more efficient? And to comparables in the industry. With this ratio, bigger is clearly better. So if the ratio is getting bigger over time, that means the company is improving. If it's getting smaller over time, something's going wrong with the company. Okay. And this is just um, another reason why I love finance. I'll try not to bore you with these too much, but we have all this mess of junk that we have to wade through in financial accounting and finance is where we get to take that junk and think about it and use it in an interesting way that tells us really cool stuff about a company all right enough of that okay so for most ratios we look at we're going to be looking at a bunch in this chapter um, three things are are going to be important First of all, one sentence that describes the meaning of the ratio and implies its usefulness. We just did that, right, with the asset efficiency ratio. This is all it has to be. It's just telling us the amount of sales a company generates from each dollar of its assets. It tells us what its meaning is and definitely implies how useful it is. Another thing we want to think about for each ratio, and we did this for the asset efficiency ratio, is, is bigger, better, or smaller, better. And with the asset efficiency ratio, we have sales up here, assets down here. So the more sales you have for a given amount of assets, the better. So bigger is going to be better. And that's always going to be the way to answer this question, is just hold the denominator of the ratio constant and say, if the numerator gets bigger, is it better or not? And if the answer is yes, it gets better, bigger is better. If when it gets bigger, the situation gets worse, smaller is better. Okay. And the final thing is, is there a kind of knife edge value separating good from bad? And we don't really have a knife edge value here, um, but... Uh, let's think of one just right away where we do. Many of you may have heard already of profit margin. If you haven't already, that, that's fine. It's just net income divided by sales. So that would have a knife edge at zero because if your net income is zero or less, that's bad. You want to at least have your net income be positive. So that would have a knife edge at zero, bad at zero, better above that and bigger would be better for that ratio too. All right, so we're going to look at five different frames for ratio analysis. First, we're gonna think about sales and sales growth. And then we're going to look at margin ratios. I just mentioned the profit margin ratio. That's, that's an example of a margin ratio. Then we're gonna look at what's called turnover and efficiency ratios. Then we're going to look at financial and operating leverage ratios, and we'll wind up with liquidity ratios. So also, I want to let you know there are an awful lot of ratios out there in the big bad world. So I want to let you know the ones that we're going to emphasize so you don't go out and try to memorize 50 gazillion different ratios or something like that. So by category, remember we have these five different frames, five different categories. By category, for sales and sales growth, Every ratio I show you is going to be important. There aren't going to be many of them. They're all going to be. They're all going to be important. For margin ratios, profit ratio is going to be important. Cogs, effective tax rate, et cetera, et cetera. So I won't. I won't bore you right now going through all these. But this is a good page for you to know. You should know the formulas for these ratios and. I'm reluctant to say this, but I'll say it anyway. You probably don't need to know the mathematical formula for any ratio except these ratios, any ratio in this chapter except for these ratios. Okay, so let's start in with our first frame, and that's going to be uh, sales and sales growth. First thing, um, I know some of you are, are coming to this uh, from a place of not too much prior knowledge, which is totally fine. I want to bring everyone along here. Um, 
And let me just say on that, um, if you have a question, don't be afraid to throw it out there in the discussions or bring it up in office hours, because if you have a question, at least 15 other people do, and it's going to be very welcome. So don't worry if you're coming in with not a lot of background knowledge. Anyway, all that said, um, revenue is a synonym for sales. They mean exactly the same thing in finance. Okay, so we've got three key reasons why sales is so important. Three key things. Things, three key, what do we know what you mean? Reasons why sales is so important. All right. First one up is that sales is the cardinal measure of the size or scale of the firm. The answer to the question, how big is this company? has nothing to do with the market cap of its equity, like they will tell you on CNBC, uh, which you probably shouldn't watch, by the way. I would uh, go to Bloomberg, um, Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio are both free. Um, Bloomberg Radio has a thing called Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene, where he has a Nobel Prize winner at least twice a month, and he's got an industry luminary or two on twice a day. Um, all right, so <laughs> enough, a lot of tangents here. Um, enough of that tangent. So the answer to the question, how big is the firm? We have a billion dollars in annual sales, not we have market value of equity of 250 million or billion. Okay, um, so that's important. Sales growth is the single best measure of a firm's growth. How fast is the firm growing? The answer to the question comes from how fast its sales are growing. Okay, many, many changes in performance of a company are simply down to sales. Sales didn't go up as fast as they thought. Sales are going up much faster than they thought, that type of thing. So for all these reasons, we're always going to want to include sales and sales growth at the top of our ratio analyses. All right, so let's go to our example here, um, back in time to the Great Recession, and let's look at sales and sales growth for UAL and Southwest. Okay, so I've got the two of them here, and I've got their sales for a bunch of quarters. So this is here the oldest quarter, and Q1 is newest, so I'll just put that here. Uh, Q1 is latest Q. Okay, this actually comes from software we developed at my firm, and we'll be using it through the whole chapter, and you'll become familiar with how it works. Okay, also let me just throw in here right now, TTM is short for 12. This is a term of art that everybody uses in finance and accounting to 12 trailing months, okay? And if a company is reporting quarterly, which clearly these two companies are, 12 trailing months equals the past four quarters. All right, so I have, what do I have here? I have eight quarters worth of sales for UAL here. We're always gonna do this whole analysis in this chapter based on UAL and then down here on the second line, we're going to have the comparable information for the comp, and that's love. So let me put this in for you, too. So that's UAL, and the second line is love. Okay, so wherever it says comps, that's the information for love. And the first line for anything we're looking at is always going to be for UAL. So UAL's sales um, eight quarters ago were uh, 3.5 billion. We don't have units here. That would have been helpful, but trust me, and don't worry, I'm never going to try and trick you on units in this class. And for love, uh, eight quarters go sales were 2.3 billion, and et cetera, et cetera. So we have eight quarters worth of sales for both of them. And as we all remember from financial accounting, hopefully, um, that the 12 trailing month sales are equal to what they're equal to the last four quarters sales, right? So that's how I got the 14,957. I just added up these four, these four quarters. Okay, and I've got sales growth here for each company and inquiring minds might want to know, how come I only have four quarters of sales growth? Well, because I've got to compare year on year. I've got to compare my Q1 
here to my Q, whoops, sorry about that, to my Q5 back here. And I've got to compare my Q2 to my Q6, et cetera, right? Because these companies are seasonal, I, I just can't, I can't compare a quarter sales to the prior quarters. I've got to go back to the prior year sales. So that's why I can only have four of these because by the time I get to Q4, I'm comparing with Q8 and beyond that, I got nothing to compare with. Okay, so let's go ahead. What are we being asked to do here? So let's compare and contrast sales and sales growth, okay? So uh, generally looking like the, without even looking down here at the growth numbers, you know, sales, sales are improving for both companies, increasing for both companies. So TTM, we have about 15 billion for uh, UAL and we have about uh, 10.5 billion for love for Southwest. So these, these are clearly comparable size companies. Um, and I wouldn't expect you to know that. I'm sort of giving you, not even sort of, I'm really giving you an overview here um, that I wouldn't necessarily expect you to have because you don't have as much experience. But based on looking at these two numbers, it's fair to say in finance and accounting, these are comparably sized companies. All right, so now we can look at the actual sales growth, Q4 compared to Q8. Q3 compared to Q7, and I've got this on the top line for UAL and the bottom line, the second line here for LUV for love. And so 8.5, 11, 12, 9 versus 10, 9, 15, 11. They're both growing really nicely, right? High single digits or low, almost always low double digits. And if we look at TTM, so that's going to be this most recent year compared to the prior year, uh, they both have really good double low double digit growth. So that's that's great. Okay. So sales um, needs to uh, sizes. Sizes are similar enough to compare, and clearly they're in the same industry and all that. So that makes them comparable. Uh, for the sales growth, it's you know both pretty good. Okay, so they both look they both look pretty good. Low low double digit growth, um, consistent growth, looking looking good, looking good. All right, so now let me give you a little bit more on how to read the table, make sure that we've covered everything, because again, we are going to be looking at tables like this for the rest of this chapter um, for United and Southwest. So let's just make sure we've hit all the key points. So Q1 is always for the latest quarter, and it's telling us up here when that quarter is as of, okay, Q1 ending 6.30.08, and so Q2 is the prior quarter going back in time. So that would be ending 331, 2008. Q3 is older and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we got, we nailed that. Let's see what else we need to nail here. Um, we've got, whoops, something is going on here. There we go. So TTM stands for 12 trailing months, like, like we said, and you saw how that added up algebraically from Q1 through Q4, okay? And each data item, like I said, always represented in two rows. The first row is always going to be UAL. Uh, we know that because up here it's telling us that UAL is the primary company that we are looking at, and we're just comparing it to Southwest, okay? And for these seasonal companies, the sales growth, like we said, is measured year on year for the reasons that we described. Also, let me just throw in something quickly here. This this analysis didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, the yields on the bonds of United at this time were just absolutely huge, like oh, two and a half times what HCPs were for short-term bonds. So we actually were doing this analysis to answer the compelling question is United going to go bankrupt before their short-term bonds come due? Because if they're not, we can make an awful lot of money by buying their bonds. So that's where that's where this analysis came from. So it's real world analysis. And in this chapter, I have not prettified the numbers at all. These are the real deal numbers.
Okay, so let's now, I'm going to ask you to be able to compute some of the numbers that we're seeing here in this chapter, uh, some of the ratios. So let's make sure together that we can do that for sales growth. So let's see if we can confirm that Q1 sales growth of 9%. Okay, so remember our uh, definition for sales growth. We want new minus old quantity divided by old. So for UAL, I want 4044 minus what's old. Remember, I have to compare Q1 to Q5. So that's going to be 4044 minus 3710. And let me take it from there. Okay, so that's new minus old and divided by old. Okay, so you can check me on that. Um, but I think you will agree that you'll get 9%. And also, you can see right here, Blamo, that 9% is what's in the table. Okay. This is all done in Excel from data downloaded from FactSet and the, and the SEC. Um, so the numbers should be correct. Okay. Let's see if we can see if we can get this TTM sales growth for UAL of 10.28%. So again, we want new minus all quantity divided by old, but now we're talking years, okay? So the good news is I have the last four quarters of sales here for UAL, so I don't have to add these four up, which is a good thing, because I might make a mistake. Um, so I have 14,957, so let's put that in. So we've got 14,957, and now minus, and now I'm sort of in trouble because I don't have anything for the prior year, so I'm going to have to add all these up, right? 3518 plus 3156, And I'm going to have to add two more quarters to get that, that whole year, uh, 3179, Okay, so that's going to all be in my numerator, new minus old. And in the denominator, I've got to put the old here. Okay, and I think if you work that out, you're going to agree that that is 10.3%. If not, it's because I have a typo there, which I don't think I do, but you can go back to the table, and if you're careful, if you found a typo of mine, put in all the correct numbers, you'll get that 10.3%, but I'm looking here and not seeing a typo. Okay. All right, so this is a good place for us to take a pause uh, take a break, do a headspace, go out and play some soccer, go for a walk, something like that. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll pick it up with margin ratios. So I look forward to catching up again with you soon.